welcome to the course corrosion failures and analysis. Today we have lecture 20 and our topic will be uh, intergranular corrosion. So, the course is Uh, if you recall in our last lecture, uh, we started discussing on intergranular corrosion of stainless steel 304 as well as aluminum lithium 8090 series one of the alloys and uh, we saw two instances. One is uh, in case of stainless steel, uh, we have chromium carbide precipitation along the grain boundary and surrounding region of the grain boundary is depleted with chromium and that is what uh, makes it susceptible to intergranular attack. Whereas, in case of 8090 series alloy, where we have precipitation of uh, T 1 or T 2, which are copper containing uh, precipitates is aluminum, copper, lithium, these three elements are present in those precipitates and those precipitates forms along the grain boundary and those dissolve, because those are active precipitates. And there is a kind of a dealloying uh, type situation, copper deposits back on the grain boundary. And we saw that uh, along the grain boundary, we have after we had uh, stress corrosion failure of uh, 8090 series aluminum lithium alloy, we ex examined uh, uh, the grain boundary region and found that uh, it is enriched with copper. In copper content, have copper content has reached up to around 70 percent, it is starting from around 1.6 weight percent copper. So, this is a specific example, this is a kind of typical example of de-alloying and redeposition of copper on the on the grain boundary. And also with the help of optical micrograph, we saw that yes, the grain boundary attack is taking place. So, in that case, it is active dissolution, dissolution of active precipitates making the grain boundary susceptible to corrosion and that is what it is a severe grain boundary corrosion and uh, we have stress which is active and that stress led to failure in the mode of intergranular fracture. Okay. So, if you see this picture, so this is the picture we explain along the grain boundary we have this is the grain boundary attack, these are the grain boundary and we saw copper enriched zone and this is the optical micrograph we talked about and you see the the dissolution is taking place along the grain boundary okay. and uh, we have those precipitates forming along the grain boundary and at the same time the fracture surface because it has lay it has gone under stress corrosion cracking uh, fracture surface also shows a typical intergranular fracture because it has faceted grains because those grains have been detached have got detached due to intergranular mode of failure. Okay. So, this is a one typical example where active precipitates dissolve leading to intergranular failure and stress is acting. So, that it actually failed in the mode of intergranular failure in the in, 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 in a and leading to intergranular fracture mode. Okay. Uh, but in case of uh, in case of uh, stainless steel 304, uh, we have a different situation. So, we will explain more on that particular aspect, but before I go to uh, uh, that 304, we discussed in the last class that uh, uh, grain boundary evolution of grain, you see uh, when you see a multi grain steel, which is let us say mild steel 0.2 percent carbon steel. So, there we saw uh, grain boundaries along with that we have along the corners of the grain, we see some amount of uh, pearlite. Okay. So, that structure let us uh, just have a look at it. So, this is one typical structure point around this is 0 0.28 percent carbon mild steel MS okay. and this is aged in nitrile, nitrile etching and we saw typical grain boundary under optical microscope. So, these are the pearlite zone. 
so these are the zone so these are the pearlite zone okay these are the pearlite colonies because we have certain fraction of pearlite there in mild steel uh, depending on the uh, uh, depending on the phase diagram so if you see the phase diagram of a of a steel on the steel part so this is the this is 0 0.8 weight percent carbon and this is alpha this is alpha plus gamma this is gamma region and this is alpha plus fe3c okay now point 2 if you consider this will be 0 0.2 percent and this is your 100 percent perlite perlite so now if you try to see uh, tie line so this amount of uh, so this there are two arms so let's say this is a arm this is b arm so a uh, divided by a plus b arm would be the fraction of alpha and if you want to calculate fraction of perlite so b, b arm divided by a plus b arm would be would be percentage you just multiply it with 100 100 you get percentage of perlite okay so now that's what here you see that is b b amount is very small this fraction is small much smaller than this that's what you have little amount of perlite present but rest of the thing will be alpha grain so these are alpha grains these are all alpha grains and this is optical image and you see this grain boundary so these are the grain boundaries these are the grain boundaries fine and these grain boundaries have evolved due to the mechanism i explained in the last lecture that there is a preferential dissolution along the grain boundary and that is what uh, uh, so the profile looks like this and there will be light rays coming falling here and there will be multiple reflection and then finally the light comes to the eye and that that multiple reflection of the light leads to reduction of the strength of that particular light ray so that is what it becomes grayish in color or black in color. So, this happens because there is a small tip because of the electrochemical dissolution along the grain boundary, but this is not intergranular corrosion. Though it has a typical grain boundary attack, but it cannot be cannot fall under grain boundary corrosion because for the grain boundary attack or intergranular corrosion two conditions are to be met. One is there could be precipitates and forming precipitate free zone or precipitates are forming that precipitate would lead to dissolution and leading to intergranular failure. So, that is what those two factors are there, but there could be another situation which will be very unusual, but it happens sometimes. For example, uh, uh, some elements might get entrapped along the grain boundary, for example, uh, iron in aluminum. Okay. So, that might get along the grain boundary, so that lead to activity, extractivity of the grain boundary could be attack along the grain boundary, but otherwise uh, it relates to the precipitates formation and that lead to inter uh, pre precipitate free zone or a depletion of uh, uh, element one of the elements along the grain boundary or a dissolution of uh, active precipitates. Okay. So, these are uh, generally the commonly observed situations we experience in case of uh, intergranular failure. Sometimes it happens that those precipitates which are forming that could be noble and surrounding region could be susceptible to uh, intergranular corrosion or that could itself become active, dissolve and then leading to intergranular failure. So, I just wanted to show you the typical picture what we get uh, in case of mild steel when we have optical microscope when we uh, uh, metallographically prepare the sample and etch it in night up and that is what the typical structure you get. So, if you want to get where want to see this particular structure you can refer to this particular uh, particular paper. So, this is uh, the work at done at IIT Kanpur. Okay. So, now coming back to our discussion. So, now today what we will do we will try to analyze intergranular failure or intergranular corrosion in case of 304 stainless steel. Okay. Uh, or we can also analyze uh, intergranular corrosion in case of uh, 321 or 347 uh, alloys. 
Okay. So, these are some of the grades of stainless steel. So, if you want to see the uh, general composition range, if you see 304 SS, its composition is around, it is a range, let me put a range, carbon is about 0 0.08 uh, percentage. So, these are all in weight percent. Nickel is around um, 8 to 10 weight percent, or uh, let me not mention all the time weight percent, because these are all in weight percent. Uh, then uh, chromium is about 18 to 20 percent fine and uh, there could be a uh, little bit of manganese 2 percent. So, this is a general uh, composition. So, if you try to see 304 L and L means low carbon. So, only carbon changes to 0 0.03 percent. Okay. So, rest of the compositions remain in the same range. Okay. Now, uh, you can have 3 to 1, which is uh, if we consider the carbon part, carbon is 0 0.08 percent. There uh, and then nickel is around 9 to 12 percent, chromium about 17 to 19 percent. There could be little bit of molybdenum 0 0.75 percent and then titanium 0 0.7 percent, bit of silicon, uh, silicon also could be present at 1 percent. So, this is the typical composition of 3 to 1 and here important aspect, important thing to note is basically the titanium, this is very important. Now, 3, 4, 7, so I just wanted to mention this composition ranges because this will come for our discussion. When we try to understand the control of uh, intragranular corrosion in stainless steel. Here carbon is 0 0.08 percent, nickel of the same level around 9 to 13 percent, uh, chromium uh, 17 to 19 percent and here in we have around 2 percent uh, manganese and we can have and here the most important part what is to be understood is niobium, niobium is about uh, maximum 1 percent. Okay. So, here the most important part to mention is this niobium content. Okay. Now, if you see the composition between these two and this, the only difference is basically here we have titanium presence, here we have niobium presence, but here we the difference is between all four whatever we have explained, the carbon content is very low compared to this, this and this. Okay, so, uh, these are the typical compositions. So, there we try to find out and these are all susceptible to intergranular corrosion. But the mechanism of intergranular corrosion what we experience in this case is entirely different than the mechanism what we experience in this particular alloy systems. Now, let us look at uh, the intergranular Now, we have shown one typical picture, if you see a grain of this particular alloy, which is typical austenitic austenite, austenitic stainless steel. Here everything is austenite, which is FCC, fine has centered cubic and here the precipitate forms which are basically forms a kind of network of precipitates along the grain boundaries and this pre precipitate is basically nothing but C what 23 C 6 type. Okay. Now, if we compare uh, if we try to find out the chromium content and carbon content. 
So, chromium is about close to uh, 18 percent let us say in the base metal and those are all in solution or we can say solid solution chromium content and nickel 8 percent which is also in solid solution and carbon which is 0 0.08 percent which is also in solid solution. And if we try to find out uh, this chromium content here, so we can roughly find out the chromium, it, this is the formula. So, we can find out 23 into atomic weight chromium divided by 23 into atomic weight of chromium plus 6 into atomic weight of carbon. So, that gives the weight percent of chromium in the precipitate. Okay. Now, if you try to find out the atomic weight of chromium, so atomic weight of 52 and atomic weight of carbon is 12. So, from that if we put those values we can get the chromium weight percent in CO 23 C 6 is of the order of uh, close to uh, 94 weight percent. Okay. So, that means that much of chromium it needs for the formation of that chromium 30 23 C 6. Now, chromium being substitutional atoms substitutional atom in that particular solid solution and uh, at room temperature or not room temperature because it happens at an elevated temperature. So, uh, around uh, 450 or 500 that 500 to 850 degree Celsius. So, this is the temperature range where this precipitate happens. Okay. It does not happen at room temperature. Okay. At that temperature since it is a it is a it is a it is a Mm, substitutional atom. So, its diffusion uh, is sluggish as compared to the carbon because carbon is much smaller atom and it is interstitial atom. So, that is what the carbon diffusion is faster than the chromium diffusion and because of that particular reason uh, the chromium cannot come from a large distance to form that particular type of precipitate. So, chromium cannot come from a bulk to this and then form this kind of precipitate. So, chromium has to come surrounding regions of that particular grain boundary. So, now if this and you need this much of chromium, so huge amount of chromium is needed to form C R 23 C 6 type of precipitate and that happens by supplying chromium adjacent to that particular zone. adjacent to that zone and so in this zone in this zone chromium gets depleted because it doesn't allow long distance diffusion of chromium so that's what it has to come come from adjacent region so this region chromium depletion happens. Fine. That blue region. Fine. Chromium depleted zone. Now, because of that chromium depletion, now here we have very high amount of chromium along the grain boundary because of those precipitates, but surrounding region has a very low chromium and then rest of the region again will have 18 percent chromium. Now, for stainless property we need around 12 percent chromium 
in the solute solution. And it gives stainless property because it is passivates quickly. And this is usual practice that we say that Cr2O3 that precipitate forms. It is not that simple. There could be a complex uh, uh, hydroxides also. If we see chromium Pobe diagram, let us see that since it is important. So, chromium Pobe diagram you can look at. If you see this particular diagram, so here you can see this, this where I my small arm is circulating. So, this region, so this is the wherever my cursor is uh, following, so that is Cr2O3 region. So, that forms on the surface of steel and that gives you a stainless property. So, for that you have to have 12 percent chromium. Okay. So, if you do not have that 12 percent chromium, it does not give you stainless property. Okay. So, now question is because there is a depletion zone, now we can have let us say uh, this is uh, one such precipitate. Let us say I want to see a uh, composition across this line what we have drawn. That line goes through the bulk of the grain, this is austenite grain, bulk of the grain, then it comes in contact with the chromium depleted zone and then it goes through chromium carbide precipitate and then again depleted zone and then finally, it enters into the bulk. Okay. As we have seen that the chromium has been taken from the surrounding region, that is what the chromium depletion happens along the grain boundary, because the chromium has lesser diffusivity compared to carbon. So, that is what chromium cannot come, cannot migrate long distance. So, that was the reason I have given, but now question is we can also plot the composition along that particular line. Let us say this is the line, this is A B line. Okay. Along the A B line, if we try to schematically, if we try to see the composition of chromium. So, this is chromium and let us say this is A part, this is B part. Now, this point let us say C and this point is D, okay. the interface between depletion zone and the bulk and then we have precipitate. So, let us say the precipitate at the center, this is the precipitate, this is the length scale of the precipitate. Let us say this is this is C R 2 O 3 sorry, this is C R 23 C 6 and let us say this is the interface C and D. Now, this is 12 percent, this is 18 percent in the bulk. So, this is 18 percent, so this is the point and here also 18 percent, this is the point. Now, as we go towards the C point, the composition is gradually start falling here. start falling here. Fine. So, around C region the composition starts falling. And similarly, here also situ same situation prevails. Fine. Now, as the composition this is the chromium composition I am try trying to plot. Now, once it comes to this particular C R 23 C 6 the composition again shoots up. Okay. And since this is compound and if we consider it to be stoichiometric, so it will be a straight steep rise of chromium content and here it will be the percentage of chromium what is close to 94 percent. So, now you could see that in this zone, in this zone chromium level can go which is the minimum value here that can go even less than 2 percent. Okay. Because this chromium has been taken 
surrounding that grain boundary region and this is falling on grain boundary. This is falling on grain boundary. So, here it is depleted. depleted with chromium, chromium depleted. Now, chromium needs to be more than 12 percent for stainless steel, stainless property or we can say stainlessness. Now, since we have a small region which does not have chromium which can give a stainless property that means, chromium oxide cannot form over there if we expose it to the environment, but chromium oxide will form easily form from this onwards, this onwards, but in this zone, in this zone chromium oxide cannot form. Again chromium oxide can form here. So, here chromium oxide, here chromium oxide, here chromium oxide if we consider passivation, but this zone, this part which is this zone and this zone, this zone no chromium oxide. Okay, so, it does not passivate over there. So, if it does not passivate then what happens? It starts dissolving, dissolving and here also chromium oxide would form because it has sufficient chromium for the passivation. Okay. So, that is what that particular thin grain boundary region wherever we have chromium oxide, chromium carbide precipitate that would also passivate, that would also uh, passivate. So, so, now this is active region, this is active region and rest of the part, rest of the part. So, we can say this particular this particular sites rest of the part will be passive this is also passive wherever we have chromium oxide wherever chromium is more than 12% now we have a thin region which is active and rest of the things are passive now the interesting thing is active region must dissolve now if you recall in the galvanic series we talked about passive stainless steel, active stainless steel. This is the typical example of active and passive stainless steel, because whenever we compare active, active uh, in, the, in the galvanic series, the same stainless steel if it is a passivated board, it has a very high position in the galvanic series and the same steel if it is in the active uh, mode that has a position much lower in the galvanic series. So, that is what this will act as noble and this will act as active or anode and this is cathode. So, that means, there is a galvanic corrosion here okay. and the small section which has a very small area, small area and that small area and here we have a large area. So, now we have two effects, one is galvanic corrosion plus large cathode and small anode. So, now what happens? These two effect will lead to a huge corrosion along the grain boundary of that chromium depleted zone. So, that is what this blue portion will have huge corrosion attack, the rest of the portion will be protected. So, that is the mechanism it happens when we have chromium carbide precipitate along the grain boundary. Okay. And why grain boundary chromium carbide forms? Because the grain boundary provides heterogeneous sites for the chromium carbide precipitations. So, let me stop here, we will continue our discussion on topic in our subsequent lectures. This is very important and we have to understand that. Okay. Thank you.